Welcome. My name is Dirk Smith. I am the managing editor for Compete Sports Diversity. And today I am joined by my friends, uh, professional referee Ryan Atkin and president of the International Gay and Lesbian Football Association, Gus Panaranda, who we'll, we, we will be talking with on a few different topics. So if you guys would be willing to introduce yourself, kind of tell me a little bit more about your background with soccer careers, being part of the LGBT community and whatever else. Ryan, would you like to go first? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, so my name is Ryan Atkin. Um, I referee in uh, professional football leagues here in the United Kingdom. Uh, I've been a referee since the age of 15 years old. I'm not going to disclose my actual age at this point. <laughs> and um, yeah, my, my involvement in LGBT has been actually very limited. It was only um, since coming out in 2017 have I taken a sort of active part in um, supporting and helping um, both LGBTQ plus tournaments, but also going into uh, big corporations and trying to merge the gap between sport um, and these big corporates and how they can support each other um, and drive diversity forward. Awesome. Wonderful. And Gus? Uh, hi. So uh, I'm Gus Penaranda. I'm a colleague with uh, Ryan Atkin uh, on the IGLIFA board. I've been... Uh, playing soccer um, recreationally since uh, since 2000. Uh, my father was a professional soccer player, but I was not out. And uh, I chose to not play sports um, until I became comfortable with who I was. And then finally, when I did uh, come out, uh, I discovered recreational soccer with the New York Ramblers. And uh, almost 20 years later, I'm, uh, I joined the Eagle for Board I've been working with organizations, both in the public and private sector, uh, pushing for diversity and inclusion through sport. Uh, I've traveled the world um, because I, uh, the game of soccer. And uh, I, uh, as I finish my, uh, my time as president of uh, the organization, uh, what we've set forward for the next three to four years uh, is just going to blow people's minds out of the water in regards to uh, tournament play. And um, and the level uh, because our our division one uh, is is like any other in and recreation sports, but we're also uh, making sure that we still remember and discuss the issues um, that many of us deal with around the world um, because it is still it is still very very difficult for someone who is currently playing in a professional sport, especially soccer or football, um, to come out and still be playing that professional sport. We just had uh, Josh Cavallo from Australia, uh, I believe a D1 uh, player, um, but you could see um, in his video how difficult it is because it's, it's just not easy to be able to, um, to live uh, your life as who you are and still be uh, respected in a lot of these major sports. Yeah, those are some very good points, Gus. Uh, thank you for sharing. That leads into my next question, actually, because, Gus, you're more involved with the LGBT-specific league, whereas, Ryan, you are uh, coming from the professional league as well. So tell me more about your thoughts on how these two different kinds of organizations, both within soccer, are able to work together on this front to promote LGBT equality and inclusion. Um, I think if you look at uh, some of the initiatives that Stonewall have taken in the United Kingdom when it comes to rainbow laces, and this year with rainbow laces, the theme is uh, lace up and speak up. And what we've seen within the United Kingdom is um, a lot of support from professional footballers. You know, Harry Kane wore the rainbow armband on the lead up to the Euro 2020. Uh, we've seen um, Jordan Henderson wearing the rainbow laces but not just wearing the laces or not just wearing the iron bands, but coming out publicly and talking about LGBT in the media and using their social media uh, spotlights to really um, get people to understand where they are and, and how they can support uh, sport. Um, you know, and looking further afield, Rainbow Laces has now evolved not only within soccer or football, but across many other sports. We've had Lewis Hamilton in uh, Qatar, wherein we stand together with his rainbow helmet, you know, and it's, it's key people like that, it's allies like that, that really will help drive um, the sort of inclusion and diversity within football. And it will also drive the conversations that are needed for professional organisations uh, who operate uh, these leagues, whether it be the Premier League or the FA, to support 
Act, um, things like uh, IGLFA or other um, LGBTQ plus tournaments um, with things like funding and sponsorship. So there's something actually giving back into the local community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, so one of the, the things that a lot of uh, people seem to, uh, to not understand is, yes, we are playing um, soccer and yes, the majority of our players um, are LGBT or, or um, identify as LGBTQ. Um, but there is a growing number of LGBTQ allies that are playing, not just because they want to support, um, you know, the, the organization and show that, you know, sport is sport. It doesn't matter who you love, but it's because the level of competition has increased as well. So when you finally get recognized, you know, by, by the grand organization such as FIFA, you know, as, as a uh, nominee in their first ever diversity award, and then a few years later, you know, have the president of one of the oldest uh, football organizations um, in the world, AFA, you know, acknowledge your organization on social media. That means that we're, we're actually getting the message through. And, and these are just small steps. You would think that, oh, you know, everything is, is better now, but it is not. There's a lot more work to do because amongst ourselves and allies, yes, we are getting the message out. We are reinforcing the message that it's okay to play. We're going to provide you with a safe space. But, you know, it's a very large planet. And there are still countries where the penalty for loving, um, you know, someone of, of the same gender uh, is punishable by death. I mean, you hear these stories. And, you know, for a lot of uh, young men and women, you know, they'd rather take their own life than, you know, admit who they are or, or even try to play a sport because they're, they fear that because of who they are, they're, they're going to play differently, which is nonsense. But um, we have a lot more work to do. So it is important to support and maintain these organizations, either as a volunteer or, or through social media. But um, we've, gone, we've come a long way, but we have more to do. And, and my generation is literally working to make sure that Ryan's generation and and the future generations after Ryan uh, continue to have a safe space and, uh, and the ability to, to live their life and enjoy the sport that they love to play. Right. Yeah, those are uh, very good points. I think you both are doing some really solid work here on this front. And now that you're working both on the board of uh, IGLIFA, can you tell me a little bit more about your work on that front in advancing this kind of work towards equality and inclusion? Yeah, um, so IGLFA is diversified in itself, and I think that's one of the key things that we've seen over the last few years with IGLFA tournaments or IGLFA sanctioned tournaments. And it's really about diversifying the actual tournament. So it's not just having a male tournament, it's also having an open tournament. So male and female or individuals that identify as trans can play together. We also you know, have a good, strong women's tournament with, within it. And that is key because often within these organisations, it can always be male dominated. So for us, it's to ensure that actually our own organisation is truly diverse. And mm -hmm. so that's been a key uh, fundamental element of the board um, in the last few years and certainly moving forward um, with some of the key changes that we want to make as, as a team. So that, that that's critical. But ultimately, it's we've got to remember it's bringing people together for the love of soccer or the love of football. And that's, that's what it's about. Um, however, somebody identifies um, should not be important it is about the, the love of the game, whether it be at a professional level or whether that be an amateur level. And it's giving people a safe space to be able to play that sport. And whether that be competitively or whether that be non-competitively, that is just as important because some people like to attend these tournaments to kick a ball around and you know interact with like-minded people because they don't always have that where they're from or within their own social circles whereas you have other individuals who really do take it very seriously and you know they want to be crowned the winners and this and, th and that's great as well so it's about having that diversity within our own organization to ensure um that future tournaments um are inclusive for all right yeah I one of the amazing things that is uh, happening um, to um, Big Lifa Soccer um, post-COVID is what is going on in Sin City, um, mm -hmm. uh, January 13th through the 16th. So in 2020, before um, the world shut down, the tournament went on and 
it was 26 or 28 teams with about six or seven um, women's teams. And, you know, we were trying to, to increase and market and, and get more um, women's teams interested. Um, and, you know, then COVID hit. Now, uh, as we approach the, um, the Sin City Classic uh, and the Iglifa Indoor World Championship, uh, we had it cut off at 44 teams. And now there is a full 7 v 7 women's division that is playing, um, which is double the amount of uh, female teams from, from, uh, from two years ago, which is incredible. Because yeah. we want people to understand that this is for everyone. It, it, you know, it doesn't matter uh, if you're the best player or if you're just doing this because you like kicking the ball. Division three is for you or division one if you want to you know, go for, for, for the gold, as they say. But I, I'd like to remind people that many years ago, before uh, everyone got really um, into social media and posting videos, um, Iglifa has been um, fortunate to have an all transgender team from Mexico, Didi Sex, play for years. Um, they are well known throughout the, the membership around the world. Everybody enjoys um, their level of play. And, you know, as you get to know these organizations like Iglifa, like Stonewall, you're going to come, you're going to notice that we have been doing, or we have been working toward diversity for years. It's who we are and we're just building on it. Mm -hmm. But because of, you know, the world changes in a second, we have to continue to remind people that, yes, we understand we are working uh, to, to grow at all levels, but it's not like we haven't been doing it for a while. Uh, and that's right. why we have to get the word out. And what's happening this coming January with all those um, women's teams that are going to compete um, in division one and two it, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, that's always been a thing about, you know, trying to build up representation of women and especially also transgender and non-binary athletes. So the fact that you have an entire team uh, consisting of transgender and non-binary athletes, I think is fantastic because, you know, that's the kind of representation that I think is super important to growing the sport. I agree. And, and I don't want to, you know, bring down the, um, the conversation, but I also want to, um, one more thing about DD sex. A few years ago, one of their players, unfortunately, um, had their life taken away uh, in Mexico because even Mexico, right south of the United States, where you can now marry in the United States, Uh, Gus, uh, I think you're cut off. I can't hear you. Gus, are you there? Ryan, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, mate. Okay. Yeah, Gus, you uh, cut out there. So, okay. uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's just, we, we have to continue the message because, you know, I don't want the younger generations to think everything is kumbaya and it's safe and it's clear. Right. Didi had a tragedy a few years ago where one of their players was murdered. And, you know, these, it's reality. We, 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 we cannot um, drop the ball in, in order to, you know, because until everyone understands and, and is in with diversity and inclusion and we get to, you know, to a, a place where everything is a safe space, um, we must continue to, to move forward with what we do. Uh, and it's not going to be easy sometimes. There are going to be difficult obstacles. Uh, I'm not going to tell you, you know, it's a, it's a kumbaya thing with, with volunteering on a board um, or refing, uh, as uh, Ryan can tell you. But, um, you know, we do it because, you know, it needs to be done. We love the sport and we'll continue to do it as long as our knees hold out pretty much on the pitch. Yeah. Ryan, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, Gus talks, you know, uh, highlights, sorry, uh, a good point there around, you know, we we are very fortunate um, in Western culture uh, and, and, in, and in North America um, of, a, of a society that is very accepting, um, both in and outside of football or sport. And certainly sport is making good strides uh, in the right direction. But a lot of Igla for tournaments actually are come from outside of, of those areas. And so it is easy to think that, um, you know, when the question to ask is why do we need to have a separate, you know, LGBTQ plus uh, tournament? We forget some of the individuals that are traveling from other countries who don't have the same rights. They don't have the same opportunities. And so it is crucial that we provide those spaces and, 
you know, as Gus said, it is very difficult to, in this, in this current day and age and post COVID, to really get organizations to understand where um, the LGBTQ plus community is. But also, you know, um, sometimes the volunteer sector um, can be very, very difficult. And a lot of the time, you know, especially with IGLFA, it is run by volunteers, people who do a lot of the work in their own free time to put on tournaments and to work with host cities to, to, to you know, to, to host these amazing events. And if you only have to look back in the last few years where we've been in, we've been in Rome and we've been in Paris and they're huge, huge events. And, you know, 99% of the time that is run by volunteers. Um, yeah. And it's really crucial that um, organisations such as Iglifer, um and host cities really do get people that are passionate about the sport and, and can give some time to help um, produce them. Indeed. And I mean, for me, I think a, a big aspect of it as well is just the community of it, right? You know, where you have just a community of people that can come together with a common interest of playing the sport or being involved who just happen to also be LGBT. And that plays a big role in, in, in pushing forward that support and acceptance. And for a lot of these people, their identity, right? You know, and, and there's their feeling of belongingness, which is, uh, I think, really important. And I've actually been asking this question uh, for the past few months with my work with the magazine, with trying to understand how LGBT sports events like the Sin City Classic are helping our community come together again in post COVID times because when COVID hit, you know, all these events got canceled and we couldn't participate. So now coming out of it, how, how do you feel that these events will be crucial in building our community back up again? Well, what, one key thing in the, in, in North America is that for a while, um, the LGBT uh, Q community was saying, well, people are just putting up flags during June for gay pride just to, to get business. And that is true. Um, and organizations got wise and were like, well, we need a little bit more. I mean, yeah. you know, we need to make sure that you're accepting. You don't have to believe everything we believe or, or support everything that we, that, that we support, but you have to understand why we are doing this. And a lot of the major league sports in North America, at least, recognize that. And you could see um, the MLS has, uh, has been doing uh, much more with regards to uh, night outs at their stadiums. I was fortunate to participate in the DC United night out uh, mm -hmm. in Washington, DC. Uh, Jim Enzor from the Federal Triangles did, does an amazing work with them. They're, they're a great ally. And then uh, soon after I was invited to the Rowdies uh, game in uh, St. Pete, uh, also uh, uh, St. Pete, um, Rowdies night out. It, it's amazing because the crowds there are all mixed. They're all enjoying the game of soccer. Um, but it's sending a message because no one there was like looking around like who's gay, who's straight. Oh my God. They were watching the game. They were enjoying the sport because that's what everyone has in common. We right. love the sport, either playing or watching. And that's the point. It doesn't matter who we love. We love the sport. And if that's the way to open a door and get a conversation started about, yes, I am gay. No, you're not gay. But let's have a conversation about, you know, the World Cup. Let's have a conversation about, you know, soccer camps. Um, you know, these are the conversations that hopefully will lead to more inclusion and acceptance around the world, especially in countries like Ryan uh, mentioned that um, that are outside of uh, like comfort areas like Western uh, and North America. Right. I think um, we've got to look at the fact that COVID has hit everybody slightly differently and some people have fared better than worse, depending on lockdowns and, and where we've been. And so a lot for a lot of people, you know, some countries are still coming through the back end of COVID. The United Kingdom, potentially we're going back into some restrictions. You know, we just don't know yet. And I think, you know, that's the constant um, juggle and, and sort of gamble that, that we take uh, at the moment. But what is good about reconnecting with the plus community is when you saw restrictions lift, the amount of people that need social interaction and whether that be through socializing um, in restaurants, in pubs, or actually whether that be on the football field. And I think that is so important that, you know, sport brings people together, as, as uh, Gus said, because they have a like-minded passion or love for the sport. And then it doesn't matter what race, creed or sexuality you are, the fundamental principles are you enjoy the sport. 
and then it does open those doors to different conversations. And so, you know, being able to force in City to go ahead, being able for future tournaments um, to go ahead, and whether that be, you know, other tournaments like Gay Games or Euro Games, it doesn't really matter. It's an opportunity for people to come together again. And a lot of these people have been attending these tournaments for a long time. And so um, it, some people are like family, and this is going to be another opportunity for them to see individuals that they haven't seen for a while in person, because we do have the joy of social media. We do have the joy of, of things like Zoom and Team. But it's that human interaction that I think um, is, is pivotal, and sport allows for that. And uh, the social element of these tournaments cannot be underestimated. You've got the sport, but actually the social element cannot be underestimated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a big thing for me as well. You know, I haven't been to the Sin City Classic since 2018. And uh, I just recently participated in my first tournament in two years, a couple months ago as well. It was the Euro Games in Copenhagen. And, you know, just being around people again, <laughs> you know, and being able to to compete and be part of the sport and attend those uh, social events that was a huge thing for me. And I really, you know, it was really refreshing to kind of get back into it again, even if it was for a short while. Um yeah, so, and then going forward from here, uh, in addition at the Sin City Classic, there will also be the sport, uh, Compete Sports Diversity Leadership Conference and the Compete Sports Diversity Awards. Are you planning to take part in the conference as well as uh, uh, the discussions about sports diversity leadership and these other uh, issues that we're talking about right now? Are you going to plan on taking part in that as well? Uh, yeah, I hope so. As long as my schedule um, allows for it, you know, whether I'm officiating or supporting the tournament, um, yeah, if my schedule allows for it, then yeah, I'll definitely be at uh, be at that because I always find these types of conferences very um, open and honest, and it sometimes throws in different uh, different thinking methods when it comes to diversity. So it's always good to hear other people's opinions and also people's opinions from different countries and how they're looking mm -hmm. to within their own organisations or within their own industries um around diversity and inclusion yes it's um it's going to be an amazing event and it's going to be a somber event as uh, many of you are aware the the head of the sin city classic um tournament itself with all the the 20 plus sports passed away unexpectedly um this summer and uh, uh ken searcy has um you know had done amazing work with his with his colleagues, um, you know, his, his board. Um, it's amazing what a handful of people can do and throw, you know, put together an event for 12 to 14,000 uh, men and women in Las Vegas and have it go off with, without any visible hitches. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, his life was cut short and, you know, hopefully we will all be able to still meet in a couple of weeks and I know Sin City um, Classic will be honoring him. And I know he is going to be honored at the awards dinner, um, you know, surrounded by, by friends, families, colleagues. And, uh, and to, to um, add on to Ryan's, the conference, the, uh, the, not the business side, but more the educational side of the uh, tournament is important because a lot of organizations don't understand that now, private sector, not just the major league sports, but the private sector in general has come to the realization that it makes sense to work with LGBTQ organizations, sports or otherwise. And it's amazing when I speak to some of these companies and um, these CEOs, they don't even know their local teams and they yeah. have like half a dozen. So um, uh, for anyone that is going to participate or going to support someone, you can, you know, you can definitely, you know, try to, to sign up for the conference, but uh, if you can, and, but you can make the dinner, the dinner is where we get to say um, goodbye and thank you for the wonderful work that you did to, to Ken Searcy. I look forward to, uh, to meeting his uh, surviving partner and to see everybody in person uh, because COVID was difficult for everyone around the world. And uh, I lost a, a, a few friends. And the one thing that we were not able to do is we weren't able to properly say goodbye because of restrictions. And, um, you know, we are human beings. We love, we care, um, and we, you know, we suffer loss. And this, for me, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a final farewell, but I can, I can do it being surrounded by friends and colleagues um, that appreciated what he did. Indeed. And I think honoring Ken at the Sports Diversity Awards will be 
very appropriate because in addition to recognizing his legacy and his contribution to building up this community, we'll also be recognizing, you know, sports diversity leaders and people who like Ken have contributed to the community and have played an important role in helping to advance the entire sports community in general. So I think in overall, it's very, you know, it's going to be a very good event because, you know, like you said, bringing people together, we'll be able to see each other again. We'll be able to properly honor Ken's legacy as well as be able to honor the people that are continuing his legacy, you know, from here beyond. Yeah, they're doing amazing work. And, you know, talking about, you know, remembering who, where we came from and who we are, that's the next big conversation after, uh, after Sin City is, you know, um, Uh, as Ryan mentioned, you know there are still countries that are that are not um, that are not where we are. Um, but yes, we need to make sure that we don't forget those pioneers who actually put their their life in danger or you know physical abuse, um, you know because of the fact that they would take a field in a public park, you know back in the '80s, and uh, you know that was unheard of uh, to play a sport yeah. that they loved. Indeed, Ryan, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I know. I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to the to the event. It is my first event, um, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not my first time to the USA. I've, I've been attending the uh, Dallas Cup Youth Tournament for the last fifteen years, um, probably since I started officiating. Actually, so for me to be able to get back into the USA, both for the Dallas tournament um, and actually leisure, um, is is just it's fantastic. But um, I think, yeah, it, it will be a somber moment, but I also think it's it's a great time to celebrate where we are going as a community and it's recognising the next people that are going to replace me, the next people that are going to replace Gus and other people and other individuals, because you always need succession planning. You always need somebody who's willing to, to take on the mantle. I'm not going to be around forever, you know, and, and, and the same for other individuals. And so it's really important that we recognise um, people that are giving so much back to the community to allow events like this to run. And Gus makes a very good point that um, it's critical to get businesses to understand um, their local community. And if they want the best out of their workforce um, and they want to diversify their business, then they need to look locally and they need to understand what responsibilities and what's potentially what sponsorship um, they could give to support these individuals and whether that be financial or whether that be through products or, or whatever you know there's so many ways of sponsoring and supporting these types of events that are not monetary based and whether you know it, it could be time you know if people are skilled in social media if people are skilled in graphic design or you know IT or etc it's about thinking outside the box and how you can support um, the community Wonderful. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Gus. Go ahead. No, I, I just, you know, Ryan's statements um, got me thinking about some of the positive, wonderful things that happen at tournaments, it's the the side effects that people forget. And um, there are a lot of uh, couples who now have families with children um, around the world who would never have met each other if they didn't participate in one of the tournaments. Um, one of the most amazing things, and I've been traveling uh, for tournaments since 2000. My first uh, big event was the Gay Games in Sydney, Australia, uh, were amazing, um, was in, when the um, Big Lipper World Championship was at the Cologne, was being held in Cologne. And so we would take the, the tram or the light rail, um, as they call it here, to the, to the field, to the stadium. And I remember getting on a tram and people are going to work because the tournaments are Monday to Saturday. People are going to, the, to work their regular lives. And I'm with the London Titans because they had a, the same uh, time uh, slot for a game. And they broke out in song. And the people on the tram knew the song. It was a, I think it was the, the, one of the songs that they were using for the upcoming World Cup. And mm -hmm. the entire tram, we're talking about almost 100 people just started singing along, having a good time. And I'm looking at the London Titan players, and they're just going along, shaking and smiling, and just having one of those moments that, you know what, if I wasn't here, I would never have experienced. And, you know, these are the things that, that do happen. This is not just a once-off. It happened in London. It happened in Sydney. It happened in Paris. 
if you talk to uh, soccer players or you know any other sport, any athletes, they can actually go and tell you, yes, these things do happen. And there are moments in life that you're going to remember for uh, forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I was at that Gay Games, the one in 2010 in Cologne, and I remember those kind of interactions as well on, on trams and in, in the city markets and everything like myself. It's it's just an unbelievable kind of atmosphere that you can experience. And, you know, if it's whether it's athletes or just people, you know, that live in a city going about their daily lives, you know, it's just that kind of sense of community, even even along that level that just emerges is, is just freaking wonderful and just makes these things so much more amazing, I think. Wonderful. Well, I appreciate you guys for joining me today. It's been a fabulous discussion. Is there anything else you would like to add before we sign off? Uh, Uh, Looking forward to uh, Sin City. I am looking forward to the future tournaments, you know, that that potentially, you know, we're going to support and nurture. And, uh, you know, it really is actually the people that attend that put everything into these types of tournaments and, and the players um, you know, the, the volunteers that, that uh, help organize is such a small piece. It's actually the, the individuals that participate and make, you know, football such a great sport. So for me, I look forward to seeing everyone um, in Sin City um, and then obviously at future tournaments uh, into next year. Yeah, agreed. I mean, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we, we've set the next few years. Sin City will kick it off. Uh, DC World uh, Championship in June will follow, and then Sin City again, St. Pete, and then we're heading off to uh, Buenos Aires. So there's a lot of uh, wonderful tournament soccer coming up in, in some amazing destinations. And, you know, I know we're talking about soccer here, but I also play flag football with the New York um, uh, gay flag football, and soccer players love playing football, and apparently football players are, are jumping onto the soccer field here in this area. So you know, to, to all um, athletes out there for all, um, all sports, um, you know, continue pushing, pushing the message. I mean, tell people the wonderful things um, that happen at, at your own tournaments, as we've discussed at our tournaments, because we have to keep um, the, the conversation going. And, and I'll end with this. And always remember those who came before us. We cannot forget who got us to this point now. Um, because the 1980s, when you say it, oh, that's 100 years ago. Well, it wasn't that long ago. Um, So I was alive in the 80s. Uh, So, um, you know, I want to make sure that that we move forward and and we continue, you know, uh, creating safe spaces around the world. But let's not remember those who came before us, because just because they're getting older doesn't mean that they don't have uh, a place in your organizations as they do um, with IGLFA. Right. That's a wonderful message. And I thank you for sharing that. And thank you both again for joining me. I am looking forward to seeing you both uh, this January 13th through the 16th in Las Vegas at the Sin City Classic. Thank you. Thank you.